All right, good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. Uh, this is now my third back-to-back -back tonight because I just love rocking the mic on a Monday. Some people are afraid of Mondays or can't stand Mondays. I embrace them by adding even more work into my schedule. So I'm excited because the last session we just recorded and streamed live uh, was really more focused on psychology and philosophy and, and other areas that impact our lifestyles and how we connect to people. Well, we're going to connect at a different level today. Uh, for those of you who listen to the show regularly, you know that my dad has type 2 diabetes. So I have a you know, condition in my family that is affecting thousands, if not millions of people these days. And there's type 1, there's type 2. We're going to talk about that because some people still don't understand the difference. And I think that's important to get clarified as well. Uh, but the gentleman joining me today, He's CEO and co-founder of his company. He spent 34 years, just a few, just a few, in the healthcare industry, primarily at Medtronic, the largest medical device company in the world. I mean, that's pretty significant. So, I mean, they serve like a large variety of roles, including uh, leading the Medtronic therapy delivery business. But in the last four years, um, he has successfully led the founding and growth of a company called Pops. So if you haven't heard before, Pops, a.k.a. Pops Diabetes, but their core brand is all about Pops, P-O-P-S. That's right. That's what I'm saying. And they're a leader in creating full virtual care, uh, the next stage of healthcare. We've been seeing a lot of this these days. Healthcare has been shaken up like crazy in this country. A lot of us still don't understand what the heck's going on, but there's a lot more online resources, a lot of things going virtual, apps, you name it. I can barely keep up. Uh, but well, anyway, without further ado, let me bring him on the show here, ladies and gentlemen. So without further ado, our guest co-host today, Lonnie Stormo of Pops Diabetes, a.k.a. Pops. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Scott. Good to be here. I'm excited after uh, listening to some of your podcasts uh, about kind of joining into the conversation and really talking about healthcare. Yeah, we keep it real. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, that's right. There's, that's right, people. We, there's no, I don't have a script sitting here. Uh, his, you know, his team, they always ask people, they have, an, I have a nice form on the website. I do want to read about you. I have your nice bio. I could go click on all your links so I can learn more about you. So I, I want to do my, my groundwork ahead of time. But in the end, that just helps me have a better conversation with you. We keep it real. So it's like you and I are two grown adults that have right. very different backgrounds. And I think in the ways of mankind, we're all supposed to meet people and have conversations and get to know each other. I find it healthy. That's right. Pretty so, I mean, that's, that's absolutely, it's, uh, it's all about trying to create relationships and create conversations that can move things forward in the right direction. Totally agree with that. Well, let's dive right in then, right? So you okay. want to create relationships and have conversations with people, but you want to take it to the virtual component, right? So obviously we're talking about technology here, right? We're not talking we about are. med devices, which is part of your, your background. You're taking it to more of a high tech level, ergo, I could say app level, online level, um, but I got to pause because I'm a, I'm a branding guy. I'm a marketing guy. I'm not just a health and fitness junkie. But what's the deal with POPS pops? Is there, is there a meaning behind that? Or are you just like rock and pops? I don't, I mean, I gotta <laughs> we like more about just rock and pops, but no, there's no specific meaning. It's not an acronym. People ask us I that all the time. What does to. POPS stand for? It's got to stand are for you, something. Are you sure you're from the healthcare world? Because <laughs> I mean, nowadays everything has to have an acronym. That's right. <laughs> And, and you know what, when you say that, that's specifically what we tried not to do when I left a company like Medtronic, which is a great company and does great things, but we didn't want another electronic company, another Onic company, another healthcare company. Um, as you hear me talk more about POPs, you'll understand that what we want to do is flip healthcare on its head and allow people to own their own condition. And so we didn't want to be a healthcare company. Our goal is not to take care of you as a patient. Our goal is to enable you to take care of yourself, self-management. And so when we were coming up the name, really what we wanted to do was have something that said simple action. We want you to take care of yourself through simple action. And pops was a word that kind of said that to us, you know, pop in and do like something. Pop about it, it right into motion, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Pop it into and, existence. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> Wait, that, so that's mean, really what pops is about. Well, so basically, I mean, as a fellow entrepreneur, I mean, based on your brand name, you just pop this company right into existence, right? It was like turnkey, right? No, no, no struggle, <laughs> no struggles, no challenges. Not at all. There's been no ups and downs. There's no roller coaster here whatsoever. It's just been solid growth the whole time. <laughs> a lot of people think that. They're like, oh my God, look how successful that company is. They just figured it out. And I'm like, well, it doesn't always just figure it out. No, right? it's, you know, as you know, I mean, it's a journey. I started at a big corporation, obviously, and then started out 
basically in a garage with one of my co-founders. Okay. And, uh, you know, it has been solid growth since then, but, but it is a tough road to hoe. I mean, it's, it's not always easy. And, you know, sometimes you get to know whether it's from an investor or from a customer and it, it's like, it doesn't feel good to hear that no, but you go on. So did you do the garage just because you're trying to take a page out of the whole IBM Apple history type thing or Windows That's thing right. or like, you know, everybody seems to start in garages, you know, it's just like, oh man, start. I mean, I'm okay with it. I got an awesome man zone. I'm all about the garage. Uh, I think it is a, a fun common thread though. So yeah, it is. And, and you know, my, my co-founder um, had a nice garage that he wasn't using for anything right now. So we, uh, you know, cleaned it out and turned it into an office and it worked just fine while we See, didn't have to pay any rent, right? No I mean, overhead. Beautiful part. <laughs> there you go. That's a classic startup best practice right there. Like some people, if they're going to go right for the VC money or the angel money or whatever you can get money from nowadays. I mean, I've run crowdfunding campaigns. You can crowdfund a company now. I crowdfunded a movie, uh, but it's like, you know, there's a lot of amazing platforms now, but either way, you still try and reduce the overhead as much as possible. Absolutely. Um, I, so, yeah, I think one of our hallmarks has been to be very capital efficient and we're continuing to do that. Smart. I, I think that's a, that's a, I believe it's a, it's a sustainable component that has to be established. Uh, a lot of companies that go right for the, you know, right for the gumption, go, go ripping the lid off and spending money because they got it. And I'm like, yeah, but do you have to? I mean, can right. you be smart with it? So that's are you true. building a sustainable brand, a sustainable company out there? Yeah. Um, so, so you guys start something in the garage not just for fun. And part of your backstory, I know, is you're obviously you have type one diabetes. So did this click into gear already while you were still with the med device company? Was this kind of like a, already in the back of the brain and like you and your buddy were getting together and just talking about it. And then one day you're like, we should just do it. What's, what's part of that? So. No, it's a great question. I, I, so it was really a combination of two things. One, like you said, I have diabetes. I have type one diabetes and for I have adult onset type one diabetes. I actually found out I had it because I'm very active and um, I would get cramps all the time when I was running. And I'm like, what is going on with these cramps? And, you know, hmm. finally came to the conclusion I ended up having diabetes. Um, and, you so know, you did not have that. You were not per se born with this. Like a lot of right. people, when you hear type one, people, you're, you're born with it. Now you might've had a genetic marker for it, but as your words just clarified, it manifested in your adult years. Yep. Okay. Yeah, very true. Um, so I, I had to adjust my lifestyle, obviously, to kind of figure out how to live with this. Um, I, I'd still much rather have that situation than starting out with a child and, and continuing to grow up. But so, yeah, something in me, you know, you know, gave me that genetic, genetic uh, predisposition to have it, um, develop diabetes and um, was struggling in terms of kind of how can I continue to be active? You know, mm -hmm. things like running, et cetera. And um, the kit that I was given and going to a doctor every six months and other than that, I was on my own, just didn't seem like it made any sense. And yet that was the standard of care for managing diabetes. And then I combined that with the second thing that I saw happening, which is the consumerism of healthcare happening. You know, people ever since usable Google was in place, people started to Google their symptoms and become more empowered as a consumer, not just a patient. That's my mom. And, <laughs> and, and, and more and more people wanted to take that healthcare in their own hands. I mean, the data talks about that. And I said, you know, combining those two things together, there's got to be a better way for us to manage chronic conditions like diabetes than what we're doing today. And so I talked to my buddy, um, um, actually two of them. Uh, we fished together. And uh, the story on our website goes, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the boat fishing and this literally happened. And I'm like, we need to be able to do this differently and use the power of these computers that we call phones to help people do that. And, uh, you know, so we started working on it nights and weekends and then eventually all left our gigs to, uh, you know, do it full time. Big move, Matt, by the way. I mean, definitely Kid nothing was. small. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you commit. Some serious conversation between my wife and I. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, how'd that go over? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, one of the best ways to do it usually is you find a way to re slowly replace the income or reduce your, your lifestyle overhead to the point where you have a manageable savings and everything else. And then you can figure out a timeline. So, okay, we got to rip the lid off now and I'm good for a year or two years. If you're really good at saving, uh, there's all different methodologies there from the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, but, but big move, man. I mean, that's not easy committing to something like that. And so clearly there's passion, right? So obviously you got passion behind this, not just because your personal story. I mean, your co-founder also has 
a direct relation to this? Uh, not a direct relationship in that way, but um, you know, I think we all have the passion in terms of trying to say, you know, healthcare has got to be done differently. You know, we keep having this, you know, public policy debate and all these other things. And I mean, and there's some reality to that. Um, but what we saw the real passion around was, as I mentioned earlier, flipping healthcare on its head. And instead of saying, why do we have to have people take care of people mm. as patients and disempower them when what we can do is use this technology to empower people to actually self-manage their own, their own condition. I mean, that's what you see um, people wanting to do. I mean, you talk about your podcast and your website being focused on like millennials and, mm. and more and more, um, you know, 50% of millennials and Gen Zs do not, you know, have a primary care position. Well, and 90%- I mean, I, I technically do, I think. <laughs> I, I think. And I, I'm, I'm Gen X, you know, because, you know, part of the site and part of this brand you are, right, is I'm doing it because I believe it's our responsibility that whatever knowledge we acquire, part of wisdom, is then passing the said knowledge on. If you just keep it all up here, I'm pointing at my head for the listeners, there's no wisdom there. You, great, you might know all, all this stuff, but you're not passing it on or you're not building it into an app. So there's a knowledge database that could be shared and virtually accessed from potentially anywhere in the world uh, by any age demographic. I mean, even my parents, they're in their 70s now and not my dad, no, but my mom, she'll embrace the technology. She'll figure it out. She still does her own self-diagnosis type of stuff and everything else. And she's actually gotten really good at it because uh, you find the better sites, the better databases, or the better apps. And unfortunately, you don't have to rip on the healthcare system, I will. Um, but they, it's up to you if you want to or not. But I was like, uh, they, I, I respect people who commit to getting their doctorates and their MDs. And I have friends who are MDs, but I've had MDs on this show who have admitted and have not hidden it. Most of them don't know squat about nutrition. They don't actually understand anything about the lifestyle component to two of the main domains of this show outside of the business and entrepreneurial spirit. And that's a shame. And I've had people on this show quote, which I'm sure you'll connect on is that we all need to become our own inner physicians. We have to at least take the steps to take some accountability for our health. The MD or the DO or whatever you're using. Yes. They're very intelligent and yes, they've committed to years of education, but they only know so much and holding them accountable for your health is actually, I don't agree with it anymore. I was like, I, I need to own my stuff first. So what are your thoughts on all that? No, I totally agree. So to me, the patients of today are the physicians of tomorrow. And when I say mm -hmm. physicians, I kind of put that in a quote, right? The patients of the day are the physicians tomorrow. They're going to be self-managing and taking care of themselves. All the things you said are true. I mean, primary care doctors are heroes. I mean, they, they have to the, the span that they have to be able to kind of comment, whether it's nutrition oh. or somebody breaks their leg or whatever it might be, and they don't have enough time to do it all. 95% of people with diabetes are seen by a primary care physician, not a specialist. That's a surprise to a lot of people when they mm -hmm. hear that. And there's just not time for a primary care physician to be able to take care of everybody. No. And so and, and let's be clear. The solution is to allow people to take care of themselves and use physicians more sparingly. Yeah. And let's be clear. And you can confirm this because you've worked in the profession is that, or in the industry, it's not necessarily the doctor's fault. I want to make sure this is clear. I'm not ripping on the doctors. Some people yeah. say I rip on doctors. I have friends that are doctors. Okay. I'm just ripping on the profession and what the industry has allowed it to become. Okay. They're treating symptoms. They're not finding the root causes. They don't have the time, as you just clarified, they don't have the time to do it because the healthcare industry has now turned it into an assembly line. And you're not, a, I mean, I think the cutoff is still 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes, man, in and out, boom, boom, boom. There is no way you have enough time to find a root cause. It's right. diagnose. Here's your, here's your symptoms list. Here's the drug move on. And yep. that's unfortunate. Yep. That's unfortunate. No, so. I agree. And, and it is, as you said, I emphasize again, it's not the physicians. It's about the way the industry has been set up and how, how the payment cycle is done. Mm -hmm. And I've often said for many years that the main thing that stops, that stands in the way of us innovating in the healthcare industry is how we've set up payment in the United States. And that has to kind of be changed so that we can allow some of these new solutions like uh, digital healthcare as an example to come in. So, I'm, okay, that's an interesting point now. So real quick, I'm going to screen share for the, for the watchers on the video. So obviously your site, popsdiabetes.com. Okay, so right there, one, I love your tagline right there, own your life. 
and you're focusing on, you know, discrete technology, obviously privacy. So I used to work in the technology space. So I'm guessing whatever databases you're connecting through apps are going to be fully HIPAA compliant. Um, cause unfortunately that's, uh, the, I think the numero uno immediate checklist when it comes to data. Um, but how are you, are you guys connecting this into per se this broken system or are you staying more high level and out of it? How are you going to go about that? I mean, yeah, that, that's a great question because the last thing that had to happen for me before I left Medtronic was to figure out, can we get paid for this? Um, right. you know, this is the key thing of any entrepreneur, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so if, if I just describe real quickly that what POPS is about when I say enabling people to own their own condition is we give you a virtual coach in your phone. She's an AI driven digital virtual coach. So there's okay. no live coaches at POPS that are helping you just this AI coach. And then we can surround that AI coach with a variety of sensors. But what we have today in this diabetes space is a very simple way. I'd say the simplest way to measure blood sugar that's on the market. And those two things together now, you can start to manage and self-manage your condition right in your own hands. And so then, as I mentioned, the question becomes, how are you going to get paid for that? The traditional healthcare payment system isn't focused around that. It's focused around selling test strips for your glucose meter, like your dad is probably using, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and we knew that wouldn't fit that. And so this was the key. It basically, and so your question, yes, we are going around kind of the traditional system by basically saying employers who pay most of the healthcare in the United States are willing to pay for solutions that can benefit their employees and benefit their bottom line outside of the traditional healthcare system. And so what we do is we actually sell directly to employers oh. and other digital health companies are doing similar types of things because they know the traditional payment system doesn't really fit their digital healthcare solution. So you're plugging into an employer's health portfolio of off offerings to their, their, their employees. Um, it's not necessarily a required solution that the employees have to use. It's an available solution saying, Hey, Correct. you know, thanks for being one of our valued employees. If you have concerns around in this situation, we're talking about diabetes right now, right? But okay. You have diabetes. Hey, we've partnered with pops we have access to their app, we pay them a retainer or whatever it is for their technology, go download the app and here's your login, that type of relationship? That, that's exactly what it is. It's a subscription service. If somebody does sign up for it, then the company will pay us for that. Okay. And yeah, all the company and, and we do is help market that out so that an employee likes it, they download the app and register and off they go. So now, obviously, I know you you have a bigger mission here, right? So I don't want to cut too far down the timeline, but you want to take this into other chronic conditions. So uh, obviously, smart spearheading diabetes, because unfortunately, uh, the the sad diet, the standard American diet, has driven this country into such a uh, really decrepit state of health that you have no shortage of diabetes uh, to to address and help. So uh, until we could turn that around, especially from a type two perspective, not a type one perspective. Um, We've got a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of people looking for help. So with your app and with your AI, because I'm a geek, do so you guys are populating a database of knowledge, and you're acquiring this knowledge from where? Like the ADA, other reputable database sites of, of help knowledge around di di diabetes? What, what's, how are you getting, getting the data that the AI uses? Yeah, so it really starts out with uh, looking at things like ADA guidelines and so forth and, look, and working with... Uh, Kind of diabetes educators and what they typically would do based on certain you know um, actions and things and then as i use the app and interact with mina uh, mina gets smarter and smarter about me and specifically looks at how motivated i am to manage my diabetes and will address me differently if i'm very motivated versus if i'm not very motivated because we know not everybody's the same hmm. and i think one of the biggest issues with a lot of apps that are out there i mean there's lots of apps out there to help you manage diabetes um, what we found out when we did focus groups with people is uh, people said, uh, we want to use an app to manage diabetes. Actually, 90% of them in one of the studies that we did said, we want to use an app, but only 10% were actually doing it. We actually published that at the American Diabetes Association because we thought it was so fascinating. Wow. We said, how could there be this huge gap of 80%? And the reason really boiled down to the apps were more burdened than benefit. And so, oh, yes, if, if you have cum cumbersome technology. Exactly. Yeah, or or they're, they're pinging people too much or asking too many questions and so forth. And, hmm. and so what we try to design Mina to do is be um, two things. One, 
come across more like your personal friend um, as opposed to your healthcare provider. And the second is to do what we call light coaching. Um, so we don't want to overburden you with so many things that you basically say, okay, enough of that crap. Hmm. Shut down that app, delete it off my phone. We want you to stay engaged because this is a marathon and we want you to take that marathon seriously. So I was going to say, would you say, or do you know, if you're the only app trying to use a minimalistic approach with an AI? So we think we are unique in that space. Absolutely. I'll, I won't be as bold as saying we're the only one because I, I'm sure there's some other app out there I've never heard of. Yeah. But in terms of the people that we're talking to employers with and, um, and the competitors that are out there trying to do the same thing, we think we're very unique in having Mina as your light AI coach. Yep. So if I'm an employee, because I'm intrigued from the user standpoint, and my company partners with you guys, great, I see this awesome, I'm either type one, type two, whatever, I got diabetes. Uh, well, well, let me pause on that. What if I don't have diabetes, but I, I want a resource to help my family member, like my own father, who's type two, and I don't have diabetes, I can still use this app, right? So it's a resource that the company has available, or do you have to be a patient? Yeah, it depends on it. Well, uh, first of all, just as a clarification of our position, we yeah. don't consider anybody a patient. Uh, uh, well, oh, yeah, sorry, that's a word. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I get it. I was uh, waiting for so your synonym. Think they're all people, <laughs> right? And then not patients. And and actually, when somebody signs up and uses our app, we call them an owner because we see them owning their life. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, the answer to your question is it depends on the agreement that's in place with that particular employer. Oh, how okay. They want it to go. So we do have people, as an example, that have used this for pre-diabetes, um, and they're basically using it to learn more about kind of what's affecting them. Um, sure. And we've had people, as an example, say, boy, I didn't know when I went and had Mexican and I ate all this rice that my blood sugar spiked up to 170. Grains uh, get converted to sugars, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I've had the scientists on this show. <laughs> I've said it and, before. And unfortunately, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't cut you up. Uh, and, and unfortunately, people think rice healthy, and and rice is full of sugar. Um, and so, yeah, that's a surprise to a lot of people. So people learn from things like this. A lot of people don't know the quinoa because they think, oh, it's quinoa. It's an ancient grain. I'm like, the emphasis here is grain. Your liver doesn't see the difference when that stuff gets metabolized and processed. All that type of stuff slams liver, and it's the same exact thing. It just says, what am I getting? I'm getting a glucose spike. Okay. I mean, again, I'm not even a scientist. I just, I just been, <laughs> I've been monitoring this knowledge for a while. So, and I've had a lot of gurus on this show. So um, it, it's, and it's a very touchy subject for a lot of people, unfortunately. So I mean, yeah, that's cool. I would hope that companies do provide it as a resource to people who don't have, let's say even pre-diabetes, because we all know that if I have a family and I worked for said company, and my family is on my family insurance plan, then everybody in that family will affect that rate as well. So if I'm married, let's say to somebody with diabetes, or I end up having a child, unfortunately born with diabetes, those costs will directly impact the company's insurance portfolio. So you should provide it as a resource to that employee. If you want yeah, them to impact that in a positive way. If, if they're in the covered lives uh, in like a family members and so forth, I think most employers are doing that. Okay, cool. That's even better. So I, I was just wondering. So I mean, it makes <laughs> sense to me. I mean, I, I work for myself and I would think I'm like, well, I would, I wish I had that if I knew that. So, uh, but it, it's, it's touchy though. Right. I mean, that's, that's the point. That's the sad part of this is again, you come from this industry and you're still in this industry in a different way now. And, you guys got to watch what you touch, what you say. Like you just said, like joking around, like you're not a patient. I own my condition. I'm an owner in your technology because the word patient directly relates to the medical world with doctors and everything else. And you got to be very, very touchy on all that stuff. So. Yeah, you do. And, and uh, you know, the, this just topic of diabetes to begin with comes with a lot of guilt, right? I mean, even I, as a type one diabetic, I, 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 I can't believe I said that a person living with type one diabetes, cause I'm yeah. not a diabetic. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I feel guilty, right? And and I, I didn't do anything to cause this to myself. And um, it just I, got activated one day. It, it, it did. And, and uh, you know, so but now if I have dessert, and I'm around people that know I have diabetes, there's a ton of guilt there, like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this in front of people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I try to eat healthy. But a lot of people um, not only live with the guilt of, you know, having diabetes, but you know, they don't even want to tell anybody that they have no. diabetes because of that, you know, and, yeah. and, that, and that's too bad. And, and you talked earlier about, uh, 
you know, type one diabetes, type two diabetes, and maybe we should talk more about that because I don't think people really understand. No, let's not say maybe. Let's go ahead. Dive in. Dive in. I mean, you're coming as the expert here. I mean, I, I have my own personal story with my family, and I've actually had numerous people on this show and other demographics over the years still connecting on the diabetes subject, but I want to hear your perspective. How do you help people differentiate that type one, type two discussion? Yeah, I think overall, what I always say to people is it's too simplified just to kind of break it into type one and type two. I don't think we can be that simple about what's really going on in our bodies. Our bodies, as you know, is a very complex system that's going on. And um, I personally believe that the human biome is um, having much more effect on kind of what's going on with our diabetes and asthma and other chronic conditions. That oh, we're God, yeah. yeah. Um, it's an inflammatory response. What are all yeah. forms of disease? Diseases yeah. are triggered by inflammatory responses. What's and triggering we, the inflammation? <laughs> yeah, and we've dramatically changed that in the last 50 years and our body just can't keep up with that. And so we end up with all these conditions that we're dealing with. But you know, about 10% of people, so first of all, I should say, like in America, there's like 30 million people with diabetes, mm -hmm. about 10% of those have type one. Typically, people think, uh, oh, it's um, juvenile onset and so forth. But there's more and more adults with type one diabetes, like myself. Um, again, I think brought by kind of, you know, what's going on in our environment and so forth. Um, and then um, in type two, rather than kind of talk about type one means you're dependent on insulin, basically. Yes. Don't yes. think of it as childhood diabetes. Think you're dependent on insulin to live. Your body's just not producing insulin like it needs to out of your pancreas, which is happening in the normal body. Type two then is really about insulin resistance. Um, you have enough insulin, but you become insulin resistant for a variety of reasons, whether it's inflammation or um, you know, a variety of reasons that I don't have to go into. About 25% of type twos are also using insulin daily. Um, and hmm. you know, that's interesting. A lot of people don't understand that. But those people should be managing their diabetes very um, completely and, and daily. And, and, and unfortunately, that's not happening. And then you have about 40% of type 2s who are using type of oral drugs. And whether they could get off those oral drugs, as some people believe, by losing weight or losing more exercise and, and trying to reduce that insulin resistance, that's debatable. And, and I don't know the answer to that specifically, but there is a lot of debate about that. And then there's about 20% of people with type two who are basically what I call diet and exercise people, mm -hmm. um, you know, tend to be elderly people. Actually, my dad, when he was 80 years old, um, was diagnosed with diabetes. And basically his doctor said, eat less, walk more. I mean, and that's kind of that eat less or that diet and exercise kind of group. Okay. So that's kind of the spectrum of diabetes. And, and, um, you know, I, I, there is a definition between insulin deficient and insulin resistance for type one and type two. Um, but most people don't even get diagnosed with that. Even I, I have never specifically been diagnosed with that, but I can tell you if I quit taking insulin today, I would be dead. <laughs> so you, yeah, you know, from your body, because uh, yep. you became your own inner physician, right? You took accountability, owned it, um, that you figured it out. Like, okay, well, clearly my pancreas is not producing a standard amount of insulin that I'm supposed to be creating, you know? So that, that, um, that triggers in you then to make some lifestyle changes and say, okay, what can I do? to reduce my dependency on the insulin and then still fill in the gap with whatever insulin I have to do along the way. I'm sure I'm, I'm guessing you did have to go make some lifestyle changes along the way. Most people do uh, to try and help with it. Yeah. Actually my wife jokes, the best thing that ever happened to you was you got diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very uh, strong joke. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that did she nail the delivery or, or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember if I laughed at the time, okay. no, but, but I certainly live healthier because of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've changed how I eat. I did lose weight. I wasn't really overweight before, but I did lose weight, became more, you know, lean. And I basically exercise every day because what I found is, I can use less insulin and I have just an easier time managing my diabetes if I get in my exercise in the morning, every morning, as, as early as I might have to get up, even doing an entrepreneur type job. It makes my life better and I feel better. Well, I mean, hands down, I mean, physical exercise has always been tied to a healthier brain, healthier attitudes, psychological benefits. Uh, and again, you're using your body, you're keeping things mobile, movement, everything. It's reminding that you're alive. Uh, and then obviously there's the dietary component, the nutritional component. And that's where it's like, listen, the, the age old saying is true. You can't out exercise a bad diet. So if right. your nutritional choices are questionable, okay, you, maybe when you're in your twenties, you could just sit there and treadmill it off. 
whatever, the science doesn't really back that up. But the point is that, yeah, you, you need both. You got to keep them both in alignment. And just because you're out there running, because it sounds like you're a big runner. You, you, you brought it up at the beginning of the show. You could be out there running your half marathons all you want. If you're putting down those sugar, sugary, gooey squeeze packs that they advertise in all the runner's magazines, not going to help somebody like you at all. <laughs> You no, try not. it. Don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But, you know, I mean, um, being active like that was important to me and it still mm -hmm. is important to me. And uh, it's why, you know, we have a solution like Pops to enable people to kind of continue to live their lives. Um, actually, one of the coolest things that I've done in the last uh, six months was hike to the top of Torres del Paine down in Patagonia. Oh, I'm jealous. I haven't been down there yet. It's on the list. Uh, it's gorgeous. Um, although I can tell you by the time, you know, we started hiking in shorts and it was warm and hot. By the time we got to the top, we were bundled up and it was blowing snow. Standard, so standard high altitude hike, man. Yeah, yeah. It, can, it can be crazy. But, uh, you know, all along I was using the pop system while I was doing that. And, and when you have diabetes and you're out in the wild like that, it starts to get a little anxious, you know, in terms of. But kudos Gosh, to you. Okay out here? <laughs> but see, this is why you want to own your condition, right? Because. You hinted at it earlier in the show, you your own N1 experiment here is that when people hear they get a chronic condition or a possible life-changing, lifelong shift, um, they feel like they have to just give up on a lot of their goals or they don't, they stop having those big, hairy, audacious goals, right? The, the bags, the B-H-A-G. Um, but no, that's, no, you have to adapt. You have to learn. You have to study and figure it out. And look at you, man, you're hiking a peak, you know, down in, pa in beautiful Patagonia. Uh, I haven't even done that yet. But I mean, now you, got, you can actually tell people what it's like to do a high altitude hike. And we have to do, that's why layering is so crucial and that type of stuff. I, when I lived in Colorado, I, I hiked five, five fourteeners in one year and wow. learned all about that. You know, you don't have to be in Argentina to figure that out. It's, <laughs> they, they have a lot of fourteeners in Colorado, but even there, I didn't have diabetes. I mean, uh, I wasn't also, I also wasn't eating like, cliff bars every five seconds like i i was pretty healthy and i knew how to put the right nutrition in my body that i knew would burn for a long period of time so i wasn't hiking with like 50 pounds of chow in my pack because i didn't know how to fuel my body right so and uh but you know kudos to you man for setting the big goals because a lot of people hear type 1 or type 2 diabetes or other chronic issues and it's like yanking the e-brake and their life just stops yeah, that, that, that's, that's unfortunate. And that's exactly what we don't want people to do, right? I mean, it yeah. should be just the opposite in terms of your state of mind, again, like you said, um, and not feeling like I'm a victim of this thing and I'm a patient and tell me what to do, doctor. I don't know what to do. And we want people to go do those kinds of things and, uh, you know, have big goals. I mean, my, my big goal that I haven't accomplished yet is to run on all seven continents. So there you I'm go. up to six. All right. Uh, I got one left and you can probably imagine it's Antarctica. Antarctica so or Arctic or the Antarctica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the cold ones are usually the last ones to go. So, um, and then when you say run, you're just going to jump off the ship and like run for like five seconds and get back on. Right. Or, <laughs> well, I've, I've personally set a goal for myself that if it's less than three miles, I don't consider it a run. So, so you have to do at least a 5k. Exactly. Yeah. Three, so three, I'm not exactly sure what I can do in Antarctica. <laughs> I think they have crazy events like that. I don't know. I mean, it, it's possible. I don't know either. I, Again, it, thanks I, to Google, I, you know, re look it up. <laughs> I just got Australia done recently. So, you know, now my next goal is to start to figure out Antarctica. Uh, before the fires or during the fires? Uh, man, kind of during and maybe as they lagged out here um, okay. earlier this year. So Yeah, I had some buddies down there the recently are fighting them. So Because I, I, that, that was part of my history is I served oh, as yeah, a wild and firefighter in Arizona. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's our best wishes to everybody. It sounds like they're finally on the downswing and got them in the control. A lot of, lot of crazy uh, devastation down there. But, see, that's another example, right? You just joked around about the extremes of hiking from warm temperatures to cold temperatures. But going, I mean, places like Arizona, people like Australia, there's some very hot, dry areas that also affects people, whether you have diabetes or other conditions, right? You have sweat management, salt alignment, again, back to nutrition, back to your lifestyle. And a lot of people just throw that stuff out the window because like, I don't want to take the risk, right? I have, I have a condition now. Yep. Or I have yep. a disease. Some people go to the level of disease. Some people don't want to call it a disease. Some people take it to that level and they, they want to make sure people understand 
don't invite me to things like that. I can't do that anymore. And that's a shame. Uh, it's too bad. It, I mean, and, and um, you know, we want to continue to sophisticate our AI coach, but the, one of the goals of the AI coach, Mina, would be to help you through those kinds of things. I mean, if you're in a hot condition and Mina knows that the temperature is very hot and you're out hiking and creating activity, um, you know, for Mina to su suggest some things to you around hydration or, you know, sodium intake and things like that so that you can be more healthy and feel more confident that you can go do those things yourselves because, you know, you're not completely on your own, but it is not with somebody kind of watching you and taking care of you or looking over your shoulder. It's with the technology that you're carrying around anyway. So in your, in the app, in the AI, um, do you have, I'll call them chapters, categories of data? Um, like for example, what we're talking about right now would be either health and fitness as a category or exercise as a category or daily life fit. I don't know. Is there categories that you guys have broken up the data into? So as you keep building content in for the AI to learn, how does that all get, I guess, compiled? Yeah, and, and it's uh, changing all the time and getting more sophisticated all the time. And so this is an evolving process. And, you know, uh, today, a lot of the data is, as like I said, self-generated data in terms of everything from your blood glucose to your activity levels or other things that Mina is asking you in terms of your diabetes management and trying okay. to learn more about you and so forth. There's the more universal data that's out there, like an ADA guidelines and things like that. Um, you know, uh, we see things continue to evolve and, and start to bring in other elements of your lifestyle, um, you know, like the temperature of where you're at that day. I mean, today yeah. we're not doing that, but that's something that we can bring into this. And so forth. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're now, as you hinted earlier, right? These aren't handheld phones anymore. That's right. These, these, are, these are computers that also are a phone. That's what people yep. understand. This is the new iPhone 11 Pro. I never thought in my life I would ever spend $1,200 on a freaking smartphone, but I did. So I don't know why. I mean, I do know why there's advanced technology that I needed access to and I justified it. But anyway, but the point is like, you don't spend $1,200 on a phone. You spend it on the freedom of knowledge and data. That's what I bought it for. Yep. And oh, by the way, I can make phone calls for it too. I could, I could literally run my, my charity and my company off of this phone. So yep. it's, pretty awesome. <laughs> but now you guys tapping into that from an app perspective, getting people the knowledge at the fingertips is super cool. I'm a big fan of apps. The problem is you hinted at this. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of inconsistencies. Um, actually, I want to share this because I, I like this on your site. And ladies and gentlemen, as always, I don't get paid to promote any of this. I just geek out. Um, I, I like your little what we do, what we don't do, right? Yeah, I love you. You care about valuable relationships. You don't, you know, sometimes you speak in gifts, um, but the whole, you don't want to put work over life. Thank you. Well said. You're not going to have hidden agendas. Uh, I want to understand re resisting the red vines. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, that, that's more of a workplace, uh, what we don't do. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, and this might not jive well with your healthy lifestyle, but <laughs> it tends to be uh, a variety of things that show up in our kitchen that people love to kind of sample. And, and uh, one of them, for one reason or another, turns out to be red vine licorice. And uh, Oh, I'm like, was that, a, was that a wine joke? Vines. Like, what is that? <laughs> you know, I, I know what those are. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, I also like your values here. This was something I really wanted to hit on. Um, you know, be a good human, right? Uh, showing up as being real and vulnerable and transparent. As a marketing professional, I tell people all the time, like you can't beat the power of truth and transparency. Even something as simple as this is why I built this show this way. Like I keep it real. We're not, we're not, gonna, we're not editing this conversation. You and I are getting to know each other. You are the guest co-host. Like I tell people all the time, like if you had a question of me, just ask. You're the guest co-host. Like, I'm not interviewing you. Like, we're we're getting to know each other, and and obviously learning more about your company and your mission and the app and everything along the way. And that's that's real. It's not fake. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, one of the things we talk about all the time is while this is a business and we make money by selling to businesses. Sure. There's a person in each one of those businesses, and it's all about a personal relationship. We kind of talked about that at the very beginning. Is um, you need to create relationships with people. And we do that at the business level, like uh, when we're selling, or we do that at the personal level when we're trying to get somebody with diabetes to see why POPs is a good thing for them and how it can make their life better. Hmm. And then um, I like to think Mina's doing that in more of an artificial intelligence way on very personal level, 
Um, when Mina interacts with me, it feels more to me like a person's talking to me in my phone, not like, you know, an app's talking to me. And so that's what we mean by, you know, be a good human and be real. I like that. Now, so obviously we're, we're approaching towards the end of the show. You hinted to me at the beginning of the show or right before we hit record, uh, I can't remember when, but there's a bigger mission, right? Obviously you're starting with diabetes, it's your strength, but you're going bigger, right? So obviously are you rolling out diabetes first with pops, proving it as, as a platform, making sure the AI is strong and then using the exact same AI to start learning about other conditions? Because obviously it sounds like you're moving towards a, a, a chronic methodology of a business model, right? You're targeting those, well, I call them life-changing conditions, so. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and staying focused on the chronic conditions, you know, 60% of us as Americans have a chronic condition and it costs 75% of the healthcare dollars. Mm -hmm. And chronic conditions to me are the perfect ones where we can, again, flip healthcare on its head and basically say, we don't have to manage you, manage yourself, take care of yourself, own yourself. And only when you have a severe problem, when you have a complication or something, you know, come in and, you know, get, you know, help from a physician and so forth. And uh, so, the, unfortunately, there's a lot of comorbidities with diabetes, as an example, right? So, you know, cholesterol issues or obesity issues or, you know, um, uh, hypertension. So all these things kind of coexist along with diabetes. And so what we want to do then is kind of evolve Mina to have her be better and better at helping you kind of take a look at all these different um, conditions and become a platform where we essentially, you know, see you as a virtual provider, not only for Americans, right? I mean, we keep talking about Americans or I keep talking about Americans, sure. but think about this as a global issue. I yeah. mean, diabetes is a global crisis. And I'm well, look how many countries, and again, yeah. I'm, I'm a big, I'm a patriot. I got, I got every version of a flag you can think of hanging in my garage. But I also know we have set a terrible example with some of the things we've done in this country, nutritionally, sad diet. Uh, our broken healthcare system, you know, we need people like you flipping it on its head, trying something different. Um, so yes, I, I, and there's countries looking to follow our standard, which is fine in some areas, but not in all areas. <laughs> I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. So unfortunately, yes, uh, there's countries that have decided to bring our fast food chains in and other nutritional things that they found here back to their country. And I'm like, that's not the culture that I want to see shared. Like, uh, I agree. And it, <laughs> what are we, we're sharing the wrong stuff. <laughs> I know. It. And in the developing countries, only about half those people have access to healthcare. Yes. So many of them, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but many of them, fortunately, are carrying smartphones. Yes. And so how is it in terms of thinking about healthcare to enable a whole population of people who don't have access to healthcare today to now have healthcare because we started thinking about healthcare differently? See, that's exciting. I just, you just clicked with me and I'm like, wait a minute, there's people who literally cannot get access to a standard computer. But if we update these developing countries, uh, you know, cell phone networks enough to get enough data passing through their towers. So these people with smart access to basically actually it's our old uh, smartphones because I hear all the time. I know I used to work in the industry that, you know, the carriers, they acquire your old technology and they refurbish it and resell it to other countries. So there you go. But now hey, to your point, I'm in a developing country or a third world country. I have just enough data finally coming into my town or my city or my village. I have a handheld computer in, in my hand. I could access this knowledge I didn't have access to before. It's pretty yeah. powerful stuff. It is. And, and that person probably is going to get that access before they get access to a trained physician, right? I mean, so this is where now we can kind of think about that. that this is the passion that makes me leave a message. You, look, you look a little giddy. You look a little and, giddy. I like uh, it. <laughs> yeah, this is my nerd and passion kind of thing coming out is, is uh, there's a big opportunity here um, way beyond kind of just trying to help people in America own their lives to enabling healthcare across a whole world where healthcare doesn't exist for a lot of those mm -hmm. people. And that's really cool. And, and that's what I mean by flipping healthcare on its head. We tend to think, oh, we need to send physicians to all these countries and so forth. And there certainly is the need for that in some things. Sure. But in some things where we can self-manage, we should enable them to do that. that. That, to me, is a really cool thing. Well, and again, sending these physicians and uh, some amazing physicians go. And I respect yep. them. There are a lot of humanitarian Absolutely. aid missions. But again, that's only as effective and as quick as the logistics, the horsepower, and the hands that these doctors have there. To your yep. point, there's still hundreds, if not thousands of human beings not able to get there or haven't got there in time. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's a very, very valid point. And a lot of us sometimes forget about that. We, we do have a lot of first world problems here in this country um, that we take for granted. And a lot of other countries are struggling. So it's pretty cool that you guys are at least thinking ahead and, and going bigger footprint on this. So um, I, I respect you for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, well, listen, we're actually coming to the end of our slot today. And I'm excited for this. I, I'm excited to see where you guys are going with this. I, I am a geek like you. And obviously a big nut about health and fitness and everything else. And it's cool to see you guys are recognized by the ADA and the FDA. You guys are you know, doing the due diligence. You're putting this stuff out there. Um, now I know for a fact, I'll screen share one more time. You guys are available on Droid platforms and Apple platforms, correct? We are available on both. And, uh, and you have yeah, a caregiver anybody, relationship as well. I'm sorry. I said, you also have a caregiver relationships, uh, options as well. Right? right. I mean, so part of that ownership is we want you to own your support circle too. Um, hmm. you know, we're not going to take care of you. Um, but if you want an owner, as an example, um, I share with my wife. And she doesn't want to see all my data. So she goes into our caregiver site and sets an alert. So whenever my blood sugar is too low, like below 60, hmm. she gets an alert on her phone. Oh, uh, wow. So then I have that support circle besides Mina, who's also helping me out. And, and that's my choice, who my support circle is. And that's really the way healthcare should be. Well, that's nice. Especially if, what, what if you guys were on the opposite sides of the country or the world and sh she was not on your Patagonia trip, for example. Like, and if next time your phone updates... Um, she gets to know what's going on. That's yeah, kind absolutely. of fun. Yeah, yeah. So she can keep track that way. Absolutely. I love and it. I can't imagine, you know, if I, if you, I mean, as you said, your dad, you know, has diabetes. Mm -hmm. You could see what's going on with your dad managing his diabetes. A lot of, you know, um, if, caregivers for their parents. If he handed his smartphone, which he doesn't use, to my mother and she updates the data <laughs> into the app, then yes, there's a chance I might be able to keep an eye on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't solve that problem. <laughs> yeah, my mom and dad will never listen to this show, but I love you guys. Love you. Um, <laughs> well, listen, Lottie, I've had a blast today, but um, something I ask my guest co-hosts since you've listened to the show before, I, want, I ask my guys and gals who come on this show, you know, what are some final words you want to leave behind? Because this isn't all about selling and marketing or anything. This is about that bigger mission, that bigger legacy message we're putting out there. And I've had to learn this over the years too. And actually this show has helped me do it. It's like, man, what is the legacy message I'm leaving behind? And uh, it, it means there's something out there that you guys are doing or you personally, you know, want to leave behind for our audience. Yeah, I would say that it's really all about the people, you know, and enabling people to be better, to live more complete lives, to live full lives. When we opened up our first door, um, we hung a blank picture frame up on the wall. And we said, the first person's life we change, we're going to put their picture in that frame. Um, and uh, it was actually came from a clinical study. Um, we had a 17-year-old who totally changed their blood sugar and uh, lives a better life now. And we asked if we could put his picture in that frame. And that's still what you see when you come into our front door. That's and cool. that's what it's all about, is we want to enable people to own their lives and, and make better lives through that technology. True symbolism of freedom in my mind. So yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Listen, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, you just got to learn a little bit more about pops. Maybe pops means something to you differently in your life. I'm actually flashing back to childhood with candy and other things, which are not good for us, ladies and gentlemen, as I've always told you. But hey, we all have childhoods. So if you're eating pop candies in your adulthood, think about that. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, check them out, popsdiabetes.com. We'll have all their social media and all their stuff linked on livedfield.com like we always do. Uh, you can also find them on Instagram, Pops Diabetes Care, Twitter, Pops Diabetes. They're everywhere. Uh, but again, this, this feed was live tonight as we recorded this. You can go back on Live the Fuel. Uh, maybe they'll have it shared on their page as well. But either way, the content's here. When this airs, we'll have it on YouTube like we always do as well. So again, we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. This was definitely a healthier-themed episode today with a little dab of entrepreneurship mixed in there. And obviously, really centering around what are we doing with our lifestyle and how can we use technology to align with all of that. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. And remember, you too can live the fuel, and we'll talk to you guys again soon.